Thanks very much, Ed. Um, I hope I've only got another couple of weeks to wait until I'm allowed to start up a new life, but uh, I'm very much looking forward to uh, the transition from the uh, 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 public service to, to the private sector. Um, I was very struck by the, one of your later slides about the trust in the intelligence and security agencies. I think this is, um, this is very reassuring. I think, the, uh, obviously, we all do a difficult job trying to maintain security, but the purpose of having police and security services is abundantly clear and only drawn out even more so by events in, in uh, France and Belgium in the last, uh, last couple of weeks. And I think part of um, gaining trust is to be seen to be contributing effectively to a, a public good, especially one that is under uh, threat. Um, of course, having a good track record helps uh, as well, and intelligence in the UK certainly does have a good track record, whether it's uh, uh, Enigma in the Second World War, whether it's the uh, maintaining, so understanding of Soviet intentions during the Cold War, uh, or whether it's dealing with the modern threats of uh, terrorism and cyber. So uh, the, uh, the public good, the uh, uh, effectiveness, and also the way in which we go about our business, being innovative, thorough, uh, acting within the law, an important part of this, and also being skillful and clever rather than violent and thuggish. Uh, I think these are all, uh, all uh, uh, helpful. And, of course, we're favourably represented in popular fiction, um, as we all know. So uh, I think all this helps win uh, support and trust. And trust for us gives us the licence to operate. If the Foreign Secretary doesn't have trust in the leadership of the service, well, he won't authorise the risky operations that we do on behalf of the country. If our staff don't have trust in us, that, we, that they are uh, uh, protected and uh, uh, their safety and security is looked after, then uh, they're not going to carry out those risky operations for us uh, in the field. And above all, the trust of the secret agents who operate on our behalf in very exposed positions, because if their um, uh, uh, role is compromised, then they face arrest and torture or death. So uh, it's really important that we have trust generally from our immediate stakeholders and also trust from the public and parliament that the uh, unique authorities and powers that they've given to the intelligence services are being used for the purposes intended and, as I say, uh, within the law. As agencies, we, we lacked one traditional way of uh, building trust, and that's uh, transparency. Um, the... Uh, of course, you can't gather secret intelligence if, you, if you're operating openly. <clears throat> but there does have to be some understanding, a popular understanding, of the powers that the intelligence services have. When I look back on the uh, Snowden uh, episode, he gained some traction because the public didn't know that GCHQ and the National Security Agency in the US could monitor traffic on the internet in the way that they could. Of course, there's a dilemma here because the general public and politicians and the technology companies, to some extent, they want us to be able to monitor the activities of terrorists and, and other evildoers, but they don't want their own activities to be open to any such monitoring. Um, I think one benefit of the last 18 months debate is people now understand that's simply not possible. And there has to be some form of, of uh, 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 ability to cover... Uh, uh, um, communications that are made uh, through modern technology. Uh, the Prime Minister must have been right when he was saying last week that you can't afford to have uh, complete no-go areas. We can't have no-go areas in our communities where the police can't go because that just allows space, uh, room for the evildoers to, do their, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, uh, ply their trades. Uh, and it's the same in the, uh, in the virtual world. If you allow areas which are completely impenetrable, then, OK, you might feel comfortable that your uh, communications are private and no one else can see them, but so are those who are trying to do you down and trying to undermine your society. When Ed asked me to uh, give this talk, he, he suggested that um, I talk a bit about some of the challenges I faced in, in MI6 uh, when I became chief in 2009. And it's an amazing organisation, which just does amazing things, uh, but its trust uh, uh, was under some challenge. The service's confidence in itself was a bit in decline in the wake of the allegations of complicity and torture in the faulty intelligence on Iraq. 
And part of my role, one of the reasons I was brought in as the first outsider, was to try and turn around this trend. So what did I do? Um, well, the first thing is to recognise that some of the criticisms might have some validity. Uh, you can't just um, say that they're all wrong, they don't understand, and adopt a defensive mindset. Uh, and the need for secrecy in a secret world is real, but it also can be a convenient shelter, and you have to distinguish uh, between the two when dealing with these allegations. So um, uh, I had to change that defensive mindset. We had to be more open with those who were in inquiring into our past activities. Had to, instead of just giving them a great sort of dump load of documents, you had to help them navigate through them so they could actually understand what happened, uh, whether it reflected well on you or, or not. And I think that helped build up trust amongst the police, the, uh, uh, the uh, judicial investigations and so on, and, and amongst the parliamentary committee. And we had to recognise that our compliance and legal capability wasn't something that was in a, uh, in a box which you applied when you needed to apply. Compliance had to become something that ran through the organisation like Brighton Rock. It ha it, uh, compliance is an essential enabler of everything that we do. It's not some afterthought that you do once you've worked out the, the, uh, all the details of the secret operation. I think that applies more widely. And we had to address the question of confidence in the intelligence product uh, openly with our customers and improve the validation of, of agents and the rigorous assessment of the material that uh, let us down uh, and let the uh, uh, British government down uh, over, over Iraq. But it's not good just putting your house in order. Uh, your staff need to know that they're part of a modern organisation. And Thank you, Ed, for what you said. Um, it wasn't just about going open plan. It was about a root and branch modernisation of the whole organisation, changing the leadership, changing the way in which we uh, 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 managed our people, uh, raised the right sort of talent to the top, professionalising corporate and technology roles, upgrading skills, giving staff more control over their careers, and connecting us better to the rest of government, and making sure that the three intelligence agencies in this country were properly joined up so there was a, an integrated effort uh, rather than a stovepiped effort against the threats that we face. Now, I didn't do all this myself. Uh, no leader can possibly do that. But you do set the tone as a leader, and you back the modernizers in the organization so that those who are trying to move the organization forward know they've got top cover, and those who are digging their heels in, those who want to uh, keep it as it was when they were young, uh, they know that they're being progressively uh, marginalized. And this did all amount to a change of culture. I didn't set out in 2009 to change the culture, but when I look back, I think that is what has happened over the last five years. So that's what you do internally, and then externally you've got to, uh, we strengthen the oversight, um, ministerial approvals uh, greatly increased so that the Foreign Secretary knew in more detail what we were doing, um, the uh, broadening the role of the commissioners. Uh, we actually have two high, uh, very senior judges who are carrying out an ongoing judge-led review into the works of the intelligence services. I don't think that's fully appreciated, just how important and how valuable and how it keeps us on the right path. Um, under all the pressures that we are under. And of course, we've seen the powers of the Parliamentary Committee uh, enhanced, and we've seen Malcolm Rifkind uh, play a, a very effective role as chairman of the committee and distinguishing between valid criticisms of the agencies and those which are, are misplaced. And then lastly, it was a question of opening up, opening up the service. Um, uh, I gave the, uh, a speech about five years ago, uh, which was one of the, uh, uh, the first time the chief of the service has stepped out of the shadows. We had a hearing in public of the Intelligence and Security Committee. And we've invited into the service many more parliamentarians and media and judges and people who have impact on, our, uh, on, our, on the climate and the environment in which we work in order to try to build trust and understanding of the challenges we face, some of the successes we've had, and the reasons for some uh, which have been not so successful. And the result of all this, I think, was increased trust uh, in the service as a whole, increased support from ministers, including from the Treasury, which have been increasing uh, and helping us with, uh, with the budget. We've had a greater impact in the service's work. Uh, there's been increased innovation. And although it took a few years to come about, there's been a, a, a much higher morale in the service as well, because all these benefits are seen to be uh, 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 leading the service into a better place. And I think this was done in time uh, before trust corroded far enough to make it hard to regain. 
um, and I'm glad to see that the figures are high. I'm not surprised MI5 is a bit higher than ours, uh, but because they have a more singular purpose, more publicly understood. MI6, by its nature, is bred more uh, over a wider range of issues and is a bit more in the shadows, but uh, it's very, very uh, reassuring that we have that level of support. Well, you think that's the arcane world of intelligence. What does that mean for you? What does that mean for me? Um, well, I think there are some lessons in here. I think it's harder for us all to find our way through the maze of opportunities and challenges that we face in the world today. There are some fantastic opportunities out there for business and for governments uh, with uh, uh, the rise of China, the, the uh, uh, modernization of India, the, um, uh, the, the renewed growth in the US, uh, fall in the oil price. These are, these are pose challenges, but they also pose huge opportunities. And I'm very actually optimistic that the younger generation, I've got three children of my own, um, who are going to be living in a, in a very dynamic world with technology reducing costs and new ways of working benefiting the skilled uh, and the educated. But they're going to be working in a world which is much more complex and less predictable. Power is much more dispersed and fragmented. We see new threats which we don't quite know how to deal with yet, whether it's the terrorist threat uh, exemplified in the last two weeks or the cyber threat, much harder to visualize, to work out how best to respond, but posing an even bigger cost on business. And we're seeing this interplay between markets and politics, which to some extent has been there before, but it's much more enhanced and is much sharper than it was before. I think not helped by the way that regulation and intervention in markets by uh, uh, regulatory bodies and, and uh, government leaders disguises the pressures so that when change comes, it's sudden and quite dramatic. And we've seen three in the last month with the fall in the oil price, the uh, collapse of the ruble, and the surge in the Swiss franc. Um, and uh, Richard mentioned the anxiety around technology uh, and technology running ahead of people's comfort. Um, uh, I think this is something which all of us as leaders have to recognize that technology is a great enabler, uh, especially for people within your organization, uh, but it does um, uh, leave people anxious and uncertain because a lot of people, especially those over a certain age, have difficulty understanding uh, some of the new technologies that are coming in. The, uh, I, I think what this means, it's harder for us all to navigate our way in a world where markets and politics are more closely intertwined and where security and economics reflect and, and interact with one another. You can't separate them into two baskets. We saw that very clearly in the Ukraine crisis. Uh, last year, early on, people were, uh, business people were saying, that's not very interesting to me. Investors weren't particularly interested in the Ukraine crisis. Why should I be bothered with that? But then as we saw it unfold with the reaction of Western governments, the reaction of the Russians, the shooting down of MH17, the, um, uh, uh, the sanctions, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the growing uh, confrontation and differences between Russia on the one hand and, and Europe and the United States on the other, uh, suddenly business got much more interested. And the level of Russia's integration with the European economy, with, inter with global markets, means that you couldn't just deal with Russia as you could in the Soviet Union when it was uh, largely separate. And we're seeing in Europe this year, uh, we're seeing uh, a, a range of pressures which are on the plate of, of Prime Minister Cameron, President Hollande and Chancellor Merkel and all the other European leaders. We're seeing a new Eurozone crisis, limited to Greece, for now. Um, you're seeing the threat of deflation. You're seeing an increased terror threat. You're seeing the awkwardness of finding a way through on the Russia-Ukraine crisis. And all this in the context of the rise of populist parties, which is making very difficult for politicians to manage all these things at the same time. And it's very tough for business leaders as well as it is for political leaders. It's a more fragmented, un fragmented uncertain and volatile world, and it puts a greater burden on anyone who's leading an institution in the modern world. You have to understand the complexities of this macro picture and be adaptive in leading the organizations in changing and adjusting to it. And, and, and this brings us back to leadership, really, because the, the nature of a modern leader of any sort of organization is one that uh, is going to have to be open-minded to all these new pressures that they're under, 
can't just focus on the narrow issues of their business because you can't stay in your lane. In the same way that MI6 couldn't stay in its lane, no public organisation, no public company can just stay in its lane and shelter from these storms because we're all affected by the way in which uh, the politics and markets are interrelating with one another. And you, you need to retain the trust of your customers and the staff. You need to see you as honest, fair-minded, not greedy, uh, not selfish, um, and uh, genuinely authentic in the way that you are going around uh, your, your work. And I think all these changes, it's partly um, uh, uh, the way our societies are developing and demanding more accountability. That, in return, I think, is partly a consequence of the much wider range of information outlets that uh, people have. People still have trust in the BBC, but they verify it, or so they think, by checking on, uh, on uh, various blogs and, and uh, 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 other um, informal um, means of, of uh, information dissemination uh, to see if they think that's right. And they seek the information that agrees with their, with, their, with their predispositions. So I think technology and the new politics are changing the relationship between uh, leaders and those they lead. And that's happening in the private sector in the same way as it's happening in government and the public sector. We have to recognise this and adapt to it and not try and fight it, because you're not going to win if you try and stand against that particular tide. And legitimacy of leaders is increasingly central. You can't exercise sustained authority without being seen to be legitimate. Your power doesn't come from your position or your title. It comes from people's perception of you as legitimate in your position. And that requires, that legitimacy requires uh, personal discipline, adherence to the values that people look for from their leaders, and as I say, uh, authenticity. Certainly, if you're not authentic, if you talk one talk and walk another walk, then you're going to be found out by the modern technology. Transparency is the second big area. So discipline, adherence to values is the first. Transparency is the second. And the boundaries of transparency are always being pushed out. If you think you're being more transparent than you were last year, well, that's good, but you still may not be doing enough because there's ever um, almost insatiable demands for transparency to check that the, the data and the, uh, the facts are reflective of what you're saying. And thirdly, it's about agility to adapt rapidly to new situations while having the confidence your teams are going to follow you. Um, and that's uh, all, all rooted in trust. And I think, fourthly, your work needs to be improving ordinary people's lives. Uh, and that's one reason, as I said at the beginning, why I think we were enhanced. Uh, we have a very strong public standing, because people understand that security is vital for them. It's a global good which enables them to exercise their private freedoms. Now, perhaps it's easier for us than it is for many others. But there are other global public goods like health and education and, and freedom of expression and transport uh, you know, e ease of uh, uh, transport uh, that can, uh, a lot of people can lock into as the public good that they are contributing to. So trust is a key component for all this. I think in the modern era, we've lost the presumption of trust. Lust, trust now has to be built and maintained, and you can't just assume it. You need to show trust in order to win trust. Uh, you have to invest that your trust in other people, and then people will trust in you. And trust creates your opportunity, and if you lose it, that signals your downfall. Thanks very much.